Welcome. Uh, great to have you all tuning in. My name is Chris Van Tassel and I'm speaking to you from the Story of Virginia exhibit in the Virginia Museum of History and Culture. We're right here in Richmond and so uh, we've got a website virginiahistory.org that I invite you to explore and see some of the other content that we've produced. Today though I'll be taking you on a tour that's part of a series we've been doing. So go and catch up if you haven't gotten to this point. The last time we spoke about the American Revolution and the emergence of a new nation, um, but also about how Virginia began to um, decline in fortune as the new nation developed, primarily because they had overextended the land growing tobacco, uh, which depletes the soil of nutrients. And so the last thing we saw um, was this wagon, a Conestoga wagon sort of representing the hundreds of thousands of Virginians that left the state uh, primarily looking for new land and new opportunities, mostly in the West. So this is a story of how North America is going to expand with the new nation um, as people move West. Uh, and we talked a little bit last time about Lewis and Clark's expedition. Um, so as we move in this direction, we'll also be looking at what happens to the people who remain in Virginia. Sometimes historians have called these people the persisters, uh, the ones who remained even though times and the economy got very poor. Now, we last time spoke about the revolution, so I won't go deep into it with the time that we have, but there was a follow-up war with Great Britain called the War of 1812. And I just wanted to show you some of the artifacts we have related to it, um, these martial artifacts of sabers, swords, and. Uh, muskets and also there's a small image of a very important woman here named Dolly Madison. Now we've talked before about how often history didn't always do a good job of recording the lives of women and she's a she's an exception because she was such an important woman. She was the wife of James Madison, the man who had formulated the, the country's government. Um, Thomas Jefferson, when he was president, he was a widower. So she is gonna serve in the position we call first lady uh, for him and her husband. During the War of 1812, she's famous for an episode in which British had attacked Washington uh, and even burned the White House. And she was um, trying to get things out of the White House before they were destroyed, uh, including a portrait of George Washington that was saved. So. Um, just highlighting her a little bit as we move in this direction. And I'll just give you guys a word. Uh, I might have to put my mask on if other people come into the building. We've got a few other guests um, that might be coming in to take a tour as well. Now, what I'd love to do at this point is pan up to this image, is 1820. And what you're looking at are the ruins of Jamestown. Virginians had been really proud of their history um, at the beginning of British colonialism in North America. In the 1830s, Jamestown was a ruin. It's not like the uh, park that you can go to today and, and learn all about the history. It was falling apart. And in a way that kind of represented um, the political fortunes of Virginia. All those people moving away meant less population and less representation in Congress. Um, one man who did remain very powerful in Congress is this fellow John Randolph. Um, he is going to be a key political figure, uh, anti-federalist in, in sentiment and ideology. He believed strongly in the notion of states' rights, and he was uh, very vitriolic. He could get into arguments with people, including this man, Henry Clay, who was another prominent uh, politician known as the Great Compromiser. And below their images, you see two pistols. Um, these were used in a duel between the two men. Um, politics can, people can argue with politics, but luckily today, we don't engage in the practice of dueling, where if somebody was offended, they might actually um, enter this agreement where they would fight and potentially kill each other under a set of rules. Uh, luckily for Clay and, and Randolph, Neither of them are going to be injured or killed in this duel. Um, and by the, by the 1800s, they had made it illegal in Virginia, but people were still doing it sometimes. So uh, this is just sort of a side note here. 
Um, what I'd also like to take a look at here is an image uh, that was done by an artist named George Catlin. He's sort of famous for his um, paintings of, of the Western Plains in North America. But what we see here is a meeting of men in Richmond for what's called a constitutional convention. So just like the United States had a constitution explaining how the federal government worked, every state had their own state constitution. And Virginia had a constitution from 1776 that we had devised during the, the war for independence. Um, but by the 18, 1820s, people wanted a new one. Not everybody, but especially people that lived in the West. And that was the big issue being debated. This map is from 1860, so it's after the convention, but it shows by the shade of darkness where populations of enslaved people were concentrated in Virginia. Now, if some of you are thinking this does not look like Virginia, you're probably noticing the 50 or so, 30 some counties to the west that are no longer part of our borders. West Virginia at that time was just Western Virginia. And if you noticed on the map, there was very little slavery out there. There was a different culture of small family farms. The geography being mountainous wasn't suitable for large scale plantations. And that brought up an issue that made a lot of Westerners angry, which is that they were not, they felt fairly represented uh, in, in the General Assembly of Virginia. Um, the reason being, in the East, there was more, more enslaved people, and they counted as part of the numbers for representation in the state. So the big issue was basically about slavery and how that would affect who's represented. And it was very much about East and West. Now, in a way, this is another, this issue is gonna play out in a lot of different ways. When we talk about slavery by the 1820s and 30s, this was an issue dividing uh, people throughout the country. As people from the North and South moved West, the question became, what about the territories that they are moving into? Uh, so in 1820, enough Americans had moved into a territory called Missouri, and Missouri uh, was going to enter the United States as a slave state. Um, this map changes, so you'll see the date change, uh, and you can see some of that westward expansion. This is that Louisiana territory that we talked about with Lewis and Clark, uh, and then we see Missouri appear uh, by the 1830s. Well, the debate about slavery is an important one because a lot of Southern politicians felt that if there were more representatives and senators from free states, they would simply outvote them in Congress and make a law abolishing slavery. This was a big fear that they talked about a lot. So their goal was to have more slave states or at least keep a balance. Uh, that becomes very difficult to maintain by 1860, the country had already been fighting about this. In fact, if we move in this direction, I'm gonna show you one of the more fascinating artifacts that relates to a pivotal story in Virginia and US history. This is a Bowie knife. Um, and this one belonged to a man named John Brown. People who opposed slavery for moral reasons were called abolitionists. And most abolitionists believed that slavery was wrong, but you had to oppose it peacefully. John Brown is what you would call a militant uh, abolitionist. He believed in using violence to try and end slavery. So he attacked with some followers a, a building called an arsenal in Harper's Ferry, Western Virginia, today West Virginia. His goal was to get weapons and give them to enslaved people who he thought could form an army and then go liberate other plantations. What happens is John Brown gets surrounded by a group of US Marines led by a man named Robert E. Lee and another named Jeb Stewart. And he's gonna be captured and hung a month later, but during the uh, fighting, he was on the floor and Jeb Stewart, who will later be a famous cavalry uh, commander in the Confederacy, leans over and picks up this knife and took it as a souvenir. So to know that that was there in that moment um, is a really, really interesting thing to see. Now, this was 1859. The following year, Abraham Lincoln got elected as president. Lincoln was part of a new party called 
the Republicans, and they did not want slavery in the West. Southerners, Southern politicians, white politicians did not like the Republican Party for that reason. So they begin to argue that they had a right to secede. Secede is a fancy word to say break away, and beginning with South Carolina, states began to sign these ordinances or, or documents saying that they were no longer part of the United States. The pen that you're looking at here is the one that was used uh, to, to sign that document in the Virginia Convention of Secession. So by 1861, you have 11 states that claim they are now a new nation, no longer part of the United States. This goes from Virginia down to Florida and Texas and 11 in total. Now, the, the key to understanding the Civil War is slavery, and especially those new territories getting added. Um, it was not a coincidence that secession occurs after a Republican got elected. And of course, there's still a Republican Party today, but very different platform and issues. At, at the origins of that political party, slavery was their main concern. Now, one of the most terrible artifacts in the entire museum is the one that we see right here, uh, regarding slavery, this was a whipping post. People would be chained to it with the shackles at the top uh, and whipped. And uh, this one specifically came from Portsmouth, Virginia, at an, a jail that was designated for black people. And during the Civil War, a Union officer and two men who had formerly been enslaved went out at night and they sawed this in half and they took it uh, it wound up in New York State for many years and then was returned here in the 1990s to kind of highlight that, that role uh, that slavery played. Now, Portsmouth is also very close to an important part of Virginia's story with the Civil War. It's close to a place called Fortress Monroe. Um, if you go to Hampton Roads, this was a Union fort that remained controlled by the Union, even though the Confederates were able to take over the, na the federal shipyard in Norfolk and other locations. Um, what happens is that men who were enslaved near Fortress Monroe were able to escape and get there, and the commander, Benjamin Butler, said that they could remain there. Uh, this created an example in which a lot of enslaved people would flock to the Union Army when they got an opportunity. And here we see uh, a map that shows us the Confederate states. So just to give you a visual there. And of course, we talked about Western Virginia feeling politically different or alienated from the East. They are going to separate and form their own state in 1863 in the middle of the Civil War. So there's no longer a Virginia um, singular, there's Virginia and West Virginia, uh, and that will play out of this as well. Now, the image we see on the wall here was done by a German landscape artist named Edward Beyer, and it's a depiction of Richmond, the way it would have looked in 1840, but also pretty much how it would look in 1860. And what we see is a lot of industry, and the South was primarily an agricultural economy, a lot of farming, cotton, tobacco, uh, rice, but um, that was a big advantage for the North. They had big cities like New York and Boston with lots of factories that could produce cannons. The South didn't have as much of that, but they did have a lot of industry in Richmond. And for that reason, um, they selected to move the capital early in the war from Montgomery, Alabama to Richmond, Virginia. That means more of the war is gonna get fought in Virginia than any state because Richmond is only 100 miles from Washington, D.C. So you've got the Confederate and federal governments separated by a very short distance. In fact, many Union soldiers used the rallying cry or the slogan, on to Richmond, when they fought battles, meaning they wanted to reach the city and take it over. Now, not every Virginian became a Confederate. Some families were very divided over whether you should remain Union or join the Confederacy. And if you remained loyal to the United States, you would be called a Unionist. And one of the best examples we have is George Henry Thomas, a famous Union general, uh, of, often gets nicknamed the Rock of Chickamauga for a battle in Georgia where he was able to keep the Union army from being annihilated while they were retreating. 
Um, he's not as famous as some of the generals because he didn't really promote himself much, but the sword, this beautiful sword, was given to him by the, the people where he lived. And a sad story kind of goes with that. Um, he had three sisters who were staunch Confederates, and during the war, he wrote to them and asked if they could send him some of their possessions, including some of his possessions, including this sword. They were angry at him because he had remained Union, and they refused to return that sword. In fact, by the 1900s, they donated it to the Virginia Historical Society, uh, AKA the Virginia Museum of History and Culture, where we are now. So they never reconciled, they never really made up. And a lot of families probably had that experience where people on different sides during the war um, still were, were really opposed to each other afterwards. Um, now another Virginian who chose a different direction is Thomas Jonathan Jackson, famously gets the nickname Stonewall at the first battle of Manassas. The Union calls it the Battle of Bull Run, Confederates call it the Battle of Manassas. It's the first large land battle up in Northern Virginia. And during a point when many Confederates were retreating, um, Jackson's brigade stood their ground and one of the officers said, rally to Jackson, he stands like a stone wall. Um, he later dies uh, in the war, he gets shot and has his arm amputated and dies of pneumonia about a week later. Um, so he does not survive this conflict. Uh, when we talk about fighting and battles, the image up here actually shows a battle towards the end of the war, but you see a man named Philip Sheridan carrying an American flag, and you see a little bit of a Confederate battle flag. And this is an original one. Um, this is a flag that was used by the Army of Northern Virginia, led by General Robert E. Lee. Uh, and this flag is, is primarily during the war used so that generals with telescopes can identify the location of where units are fighting. If the flag falls, you know that that, that position's been lost. Um, but it becomes a different kind of symbol after the war. And I'll just really quickly mention that, especially in the 1950s and 60s, when there was a movement called the Civil Rights Movement, African Americans wanted their full citizenship uh, and the rights that went with that. Um, because of racism, a lot of white Southerners opposed those rights. So during the Civil Rights Movement, sometimes people would use this Confederate battle flag to show opposition to black civil rights. Um, but during the war, it basically serves a very functional purpose. Um, I mentioned that just to uh, let you know that sometimes people still today argue about the meaning of that flag uh, and that's what happens with symbols a lot of times. Now this window right here is not one you wanna be on the other side of because this is, as it might appear, a jail. Um, this was from Libby Prison in Richmond. And this wasn't the bad prison. The bad, bad prison camp was Belle Isle. That's a rock out in the middle of the James River. If you were an enlisted man, you could be sent there and you could die of hunger and exposure to the weather. Um, prison camps were terrible in the North and the South. Neither side has a great record with how they treated their prisoners. This one, however, was for officers. So if you were a captain or a major, you would be sent to Libby Prison, which at least had a roof and better conditions. Um, this window was taken out of it. Um, after the war, the building sort of became a curiosity to a lot of Americans, uh, and parts of it were taken to different places. Um, but it's also a famous location where 109 men were able to dig a tunnel and escape um, during the war. Some of them were able to find refuge in the home of a woman named Elizabeth Van Lu up in Church Hill, Richmond. She's another one of those people you'd call a unionist. She was a Southern lady, but a Yankee spy. Yankee mean in union. She, she never declared her um, allegiance to the Confederacy. And it was kind of an open secret. People knew where her sympathies lay, um, but she ran and operated a spy ring which got valuable information out of the Confederate capital and to the Union generals. After the war, um, President Ulysses Grant is going to appoint her as postmaster of Richmond, which meant she was the executive of the postal system. Now, we talked about technology a couple of times, and passing through this area, you see a display of weapons. 
in a former video, we talked about the Revolutionary War muskets, but by the Civil War, the, the firearms have become far more accurate and far more deadly. So these are called rifles. They send a bullet spinning, like if you were throwing a spiral ball, it just allows it to go much further and straighter. And you can see that these bullets would be um, wrapped up with paper and gunpowder in what's called a cartridge. Here in Richmond, um, the factory where they made these cartridges was on an island called Brown's Island. And the work was typically done um, by women and teenage girls. And they placed that factory on an island because lots of gunpowder can be dangerous. And a terrible tragedy occurs where it blew up and 30 some women and girls as young as 14 died in the explosion. Um, so that's what you would call a civilian tragedy. Typically with war, we think of soldiers dying, but sometimes civilians get killed by accident or get caught in the crossfire. Um, and that's another uh, casualty of war. Casualties meaning anybody in a battle, a casualty means you were either killed, captured or wounded. Uh, and if you're wounded, well, that, that can be a lot worse than today because they didn't know much about medicine compared to our knowledge in, in 2020. Uh, here we see men who've got bandaged legs and crutches, and I'm gonna count um, him lucky if he keeps that leg because a lot of men who were shot, the bone could get shattered and you could get an infection called gangrene that would kill you if you don't remove that limb quickly. So amputation was the procedure where surgeons would use a bone saw to actually cut the arm or leg off of a person. Typically there was anesthesia like ether that would put the person to sleep first, but sometimes that was not available. So these uh, devices here um, are actually from a surgeon's kit. They show scalpels, a tourniquet to staunch the flow of blood, the bone saw, uh, trepanning devices to remove bullets. Um, and basically being a surgeon, you, some were well-trained, but others just followed around somebody else and learned from them as an apprentice. Uh, they didn't know what bacteria was. So if you had a wound, they didn't know to wash their hands to prevent in infections from being spread. I think maybe one last piece of technology that we'll peek at with the Virginia story is this large painting uh, that shows a battle off Hampton Roads, Virginia, involving two ships, not the biggest ships. These are small ironclad ships, which was a new type of vessel where it had armor. It seems logical to us today that Navy ships should have metal, but this was an innovation at the time. And basically the battle was a draw. The CSS Virginia, also known as the Merrimack, um, fought to a draw with the Monitor, which was this little Union one um, one observer said it looked like a cheese box on a raft, but it was a pretty strong cheese box because that little turret, the round part, could spin in any direction, which gave it really good fire uh, accuracy or the ability to shoot quickly. Um, now, that battle wasn't significant because lots of ships sunk. It was an example of new technology being used. And by the end of the war, navies on both sides have lots of ironclads. Passing by here, we've got a uniform that was worn by a man named Jeb Stewart, who rode on horseback and soldiers on horseback were called cavalry. Um, the main parts of an army back then were your cavalry, your men who marched were infantry, uh, and of course we just saw the Navy over there as well. Now we're gonna skip to the end of the Civil War real quickly with a map that shows Richmond and Petersburg. And by late 1864, Union General Ulysses S. Grant had stretched his army from Richmond down to Petersburg with a goal of encircling it. And for 10 months, Richmond and Petersburg were under a siege. The idea was if they could cut off the rail line where trains could bring supplies to Richmond, the Confederacy, uh, the capital would have to be abandoned. Um, and this idea eventually succeeds. This is the painting of the Battle of Five Forks. Uh, and essentially that's going to be the, the battle that requires the Confederates to evacuate the city. As they are evacuating Richmond, the Confederate government um, had made a law that basically said you had to destroy any materials that could benefit the enemy. 
So warehouses with tobacco and cotton in Richmond were intentionally set on fire by the evacuating army. Now what they didn't plan on was the wind picking up and spreading those fires throughout the city. Here we can see a little bit of the Capitol building designed by Thomas Jefferson back in the 1700s. Um, but what we see after is a map of Richmond showing in the black areas which parts burned. It's not the whole city or even the majority, but it is about 100% of the business district. This is where commerce and uh, this is where all the banks were. So that's economically gonna devastate the Confederacy. The Confederate Army did escape the city, they fight a small battle at a place called Sailor's Creek, and the next day they're basically going to surrender at Appomattox Courthouse. Um, April 9, 1865, this is a painting done uh, by an artist named Jerome Ferris showing Confederate General Robert E. Lee shaking hands with Ulysses S. Grant in a surrender ceremony that effectively ends the war. There were other Confederate armies in the field, but they will surrender shortly after. Um, one of the really intriguing artifacts we have are these three stars that are from the collar of Lee's uniform that he wore during the surrender. Um, and so this will bring an end to the Civil War and the beginning of this time period called Reconstruction. So one of the aspects of Reconstruction, we're talking about the 11 Southern states that had seceded have to come back into the Union. And there were a couple of phases. The president controlled Reconstruction for a short time. Then Congress took over and said, we want the South to make more changes before they become part of the country again. And they actually left Union soldiers in Southern states to make sure some of these things happened. Um, we've talked about changing the Constitution before through the process of making amendments. And three major amendments are going to become part of that document during Reconstruction. The 13th Amendment abolished slavery um, throughout the country. And so that meant that three and a half million Southerners who had been enslaved are now free people. But there's still gonna be a big question mark about what that freedom means. The 14th Amendment is gonna say anybody who was born in the United States, including formerly enslaved people, are now citizens. Um, and that's why we have what we call birthright citizenship in this nation. The 15th Amendment said black men could now vote. Um, and so this is going to be key to some of the political changes taking place in this time period. What we find with Reconstruction is that there is this expansion of rights, but then it's followed by a retraction of those rights. Um, over time, white people will begin to take over the government again um, that are opposed to black civil rights. And we get the emergence of what are called Jim Crow laws. Now, a couple other things that we can look at in this section, there's a statue, a plaster model of Lee here. And the little medals are from reunions that would take place between um, former Union and Confederate soldiers. After the war, they would come back together occasionally to talk about the battles they had fought in. Um, and sometimes uh, this idea of reconciling between North and South left out the experience and concerns of African Americans. Uh, and what we see is that uh, as Reconstruction ends, new laws get created that make it difficult to vote. So the 15th Amendment said African American men could vote, but things like poll taxes would make it very economically difficult to pay a tax to vote. Uh, you would have to maybe pass a test called a literacy test. And back then there was very little public education. So um, these are difficulties that were intentionally made to kind of take some of that power back. Now, during Reconstruction, one symbol of, of this episode is the carpet bag. This is a type of luggage that was often carried by Northerners when they traveled south. And sometimes uh, people that came to the South during this time period were looking to get rich quick and maybe take advantage of people who lived here. Other carpetbaggers were people working for this new agency called the Freedmen's Bureau. They were doing good work, trying to provide uh, food and education. Um, there were schools administered by the Freedmen's Bureau here in Richmond. Now the big artifact we've got 
is a funeral hertz by a uh, belonged to the ad price funeral establishment a coffin could be carried in the back of this vehicle uh, drawn by horses and ad price was sort of a symbol of the black economy in richmond especially uh, an area called jackson ward which was a sort of a commercial um, hub for the black community because of jim crow african americans couldn't shop at the same stores that white people could. They couldn't eat at the same restaurants. They couldn't access credit from the banks that were run by, by white bank executives. And so um, African-Americans began to meet those needs themselves. Uh, this is a photograph of a famous Richmonder named Maggie Lena Walker. It's a really great statue of her on Broad Street. She operated and was the first female president of a bank called the St. Luke's Penny Saving Bank. Um, St. Luke's was this, what we call a fraternal order. Uh, women would have chapters as well. And black and white men would often join organizations that allowed them to network and make friends and business connections. Um, another really neat artifact here is a helmet from one of these organizations called the Knights of Pythias. Often these groups would um, combine their resources to provide decent funerals for the members when they passed away. Um, but they would also take some of that money and open businesses. Now, um, we talked about more people being able to vote meant more people could get elected. Uh, John Mercer Langston is going to be the first African-American congressman elected uh, in this time period, and he gets elected from Virginia. Um, he gets to Congress and they try to prevent him from taking his seat, uh, and he only is allowed to basically serve for six months of his two-year term. Um, but historically, he becomes the first black man in Congress. Uh, and so things were changing. There was resistance to these new Jim Crow laws. But we'll pick up with that story and more uh, next time when we gather to finish the exhibit Story of Virginia with a look at the New South and the 20th century. So thank you all for joining in. And remember to check out our website when you get a chance, virginiahistory.org. Uh, and have a great day.